So let's take a little bit more detailed look at the configuration steps required to build a point-to-point -point VPN on the ASA. Uh, first, we want to make sure that Ike is enabled on the interface. Uh, a lot of times this is enabled by default, but it's something we just want to double check. We never want to assume. Now, if Ike is enabled, it means we're basically listening with the service on UDP 500 for incoming negotiations. Now again, remember looking at security from a principle of, um, I guess security 101 would say, you know, just basically shut it off if you don't need it. If you have a firewall and you're not configuring VPNs at that moment, go ahead and just turn off IPsec. How do we do that? By disabling Ike. There have been vulnerabilities in the past, you can do a quick Google search, where somebody could actually perform remote code execution against your firewall and take it over based on a vulnerability in the service. Does this mean that Ike is bad? Of course not. Any service, any piece of computer software could have a vulnerability. It just reinforces the concept of turn it off if you're not using it. IPv6, it's on by default on all of our devices. Are you not using it? Disable it. That way it can't be attacked. Um, this is very, very similar. So again, looking at our different devices, we may have different pairs of firewalls, some that we're just using for traffic filtering, other equipment that we're using just for terminating remote connections. Well, in that case, turn off IPsec where we're not using it. Uh, again, it's just going to be like a regular old service. Next, uh, assuming that it is enabled because we do want to perform VPNs, we can create a connection profile. This is where we'll specify the VPN peer, we'll identify traffic that should be protected, both the local network trying to access the remote network, we can configure our Ike authentication, pre-shared keys or digital certificates, as well as our Ike policy. Additionally, when we configure the IPsec proposal, this is going to hold our transform set. And the transform set is basically saying this is how we want to protect the traffic that we identified uh, in the previous step, where we were specifying local and protected networks. Now, optionally, you want to configure NAT exemption. I typically do this. I don't know that I want a NAT between my, different, my, between my different offices. Why? I like seeing the real IP addresses that are being used. If there's a host that's infected, it's trying to talk to another system at the other site, I want to look at those logs and I want to see a valid address. Um, however, you can also do implementations where all of the hosts at the remote office would be hidden behind a single IP. Maybe that's desirable based on your circumstances. If you want that, you can do it. Additionally, we could allow VPN traffic with an ACL. Think about it. When traffic is being passed between one router and another, is the IPsec traffic going to be allowed? We know the intermediate devices. And that is, let's say we've got router A on the left and we've got an ASA on the right. The ASA will be B. They want to, they want to build a VPN together. But in front of that ASA that's on our right, maybe we've got an ASR and it's connected to a couple service providers, it's doing BGP and it's doing some filtering. If we've got an access control list filtering on this perimeter device and it's gonna be letting traffic through, we want to allow at a minimum UDP 500 as well as IPsec ESP. This is the layer four protocol that we want to use, not TCP or UDP, but ESP. If you're using AH, allow it. If you intend to use NAT traversal, NAT T, remember that we want to allow UDP 4500 through. If you're going to be using IPsec, um, this is valid. When we start looking at SSL, remember that you want to allow TCP 443 as well as UDP 443. That's used for Datagram TLS. We'll talk about this later. Just wanted to mention them additionally because we're thinking about access control lists that could be in the middle here prohibiting IPsec traffic from getting through or SSL VPN traffic from getting through. So just make sure all of your ports are, uh, are going to be allowed. Additionally, we can configure static routing as needed, uh, steering traffic into those tunnel interfaces if we're using them. So here's a close example, uh, just kind of showing us, uh, you know, tr connecting the network on the left to the network on the right. Basically, the green indicates unencrypted traffic. That traffic would come in, hit our firewall, the firewall would have a policy that says this traffic should be protected. At that point, everything moving across the wire here is going to be ESP and IP. The source address, this firewall on the left. The destination address, the firewall on the right. Once it gets there, again, we look at that ESP 
segment, we look at the security parameter index. We correlate that with the security association, and we go, ah, it's using ESP AES. It's using SHA-256. Uh, here's my key that was generated using Diffie-Hellman and then I'm going to use to decrypt it. So the security parameter index is just kind of like a 32-bit unique ID that identifies the circuit. It's going to be the same for all the packets that come across for this flow. As those packets are coming in, again, they get hooked to a security association that says this is how you decrypt the packet. Once it's decrypted, we want to make sure that it's the same as it came in. Again, that's where we do the integrity check. And that integrity check is more than just an integrity check. It's HMAC, isn't it? Hashed message authentication code, because the hash for this individual data set is going to include a special key. So again, our data has been encrypted. Once it was decrypted, the integrity has been validated. Once we know everything's good to go, it comes out the other side here in clear text again. So going through on the ASA, just making sure everything's set up, um, looking at the outside interface, do you still use Ike version 1? If you don't have legacy devices, if you don't have a reason to support this, deselect it to take away support for this. Again, shut off anything that we don't need. Do we want to allow Ike version 2? Yep. How about traffic that is VPN, that's coming through our VPN, should it ignore interface ACLs? So let's say I've got an uh, access control list outbound on my inside interface. So traffic that's being sent out of the inside interface, is there an ACL there? Sure. What happens to my VPN traffic? In this case, it would be trusted and it would bypass it. If you don't want that to be the case, deselect it. So there's a wizard within ASDM that makes setting up VPNs extremely straightforward. Lots of drop-down boxes. It's, it's very intuitive. You can have a VPN up and running in 60 seconds. Um, that said, there are some advanced options that you can't always touch. Those are hidden beneath this folder called advanced. Not really hidden, right where you'd expect to find them. Here we can see concepts like tunnel groups. These are peers that we're talking to, different sites. Crypto maps, how do we protect our traffic? Ike, pro, uh, uh, Ike policies, how are we going to secure the management session? IPsec proposals and transform sets, how do we protect the data session? So we can go through each of these to tweak and tune our configuration as needed. Below, we see a connection profile. And this is the rest, where the rest of our parameters are configured. So you've got a name. This is just the peer's IP address. So that's the public IP of the other site. How do I get there? Using the outside interface. What traffic do I want to protect? Here's where we have a network object called inside network that defines my inside network. Here we've got another network object called remote network. Now, that's fine if you've got two sites. If we've got more than two sites, you're going to want to be more descriptive. Maybe we've got a Phoenix network and we've got an Austin network. We would name each of them here. Is Ike version 1 enabled? Is Ike version 2 enabled? And then what policy can we use to protect this traffic? Remember, NAT exemption says when we're moving traffic from our local site to the remote site, should that traffic be NATed? Typically, we want to put an exemption there. So the ACL that we're using to describe what traffic should be NATed, we'll just add a deny statement. We'll say, hey, firewall, when you see traffic coming from Tampa going to Phoenix, do not NAT it. How about everything else? Go nuts. So if I'm trying to get to Google, if I'm trying to get to Cisco.com, all my traffic would be NATed. It's just traffic between the sites that I would leave alone. Here we see on the ASA the ability to verify the routing table. Uh, looking at a routing table, in this case, it's very simple. We've just got a static route, and it's a default route on our outside interface. So we say, if you want to get anywhere, go here as the next hop. How does that work out for us? Well, if you're trying to get to the remote office, even though it's an RFC 1918 address, when you send that packet to the remote office, it's just going to use the routing table that says send it to the internet. As you try to leave that outside interface to get to the internet, that's where you hit that crypto map. Crypto map determines the traffic should be protected, and it applies your security policy. Here we've got a screen that just kind of walks us through basically a flow chart of, once again, how to troubleshoot that traffic. Um, is our tunnel up? Well, no, because we should be able to reach resources at the other side. Um, if you're at the command line, just doing a show crypto IPsec 
uh, should, should get the job done. Alternatively, if you're within ASDM, if you're within uh, Firepower Management Center, you can view the active tunnels. So if traffic is not flowing through the tunnel, if the tunnel's not up at all, you, know, you could do this in different orders, but the way that they're deciding to start is making sure VPN traffic is allowed. In other words, do you have intermediate devices that are blocking UDP 500? Now you could go through all those devices uh, by hand and, and look through the configs, or you could just try building a connection to the router from where you're at. So try to connect that remote router. Uh, there's a utility out there in Linux uh, called IkeScan. And it's for discovering VPN portals for security audits, but this is also great for just testing. It's like, hey, can I negotiate Ike with this remote IP address? If so, fantastic. We know UDP 500 is working. We still don't know about ESP, though. So again, Ike scan verifies UDP 500. As far as ESP getting through, could be a bit trickier. Again, we can just verify ACL configurations. But if, uh, if we can negotiate an essay for Isocamp, we know that Ike is going through. Um, is VPN traffic exempted from NAT? This is just going to be part of your NAT configuration. Pretty straightforward. Uh, again, looking next, we'd say, do we have a route for the remote network? Well, you probably have a default route. Is that what's most appropriate? Maybe you should be using a tunnel interface. We just want to make sure that if we try to get to that remote network, that we, we would use an interface that has a security policy applied to it that's going to protect our traffic. If we're going to the right interface, we want to see the security associations established. Show crypto, Ike v2, essay. At that point, if it's up, we know that our management session's good. So the next thing to check on is a data session. This is established in phase two. We look at that IPsec essay. If that's up, we're good to go. Traffic should be flowing through the tunnel.